Well, I think what's important about the Monitor, it had changed the way Navy wars have been fought since that day and will be fought forevermore in the future. The firing of the weapons was directly related to the navigation of the ship. You had to be able to turn the boat in such a manner that would bring the guns to bear on the enemy. But with the Monitor for the first time, with the innovation of the revolving gun turret, those two systems were totally independent of one another. So the boat could be navigated in a way that was most efficient and advantageous to the vessel, while the gun crews could fire and bring their weapons to bear on the enemy, independent of what was going on with the ship's navigation. This was a huge revolution. On March 9, 1862, the Monitor arrived in Hampton Roads the day after the Confederate ironclad Virginia had come out and literally proved to the world that uh, the reign of the wooden warship was at an end. For a four-hour battle, neither ship could materially they fought at distances which the ships were actually touching to where they were several hundred yards and neither vessel could you know or, uh, find a weak spot. The monitor obviously a lot more nimble because of her shallow draft in Hampton Road. She could pretty much want it in and out of the channel and so the monitor would literally just do circles around the Virginia. Both sides claimed but realistically the, the clear winner was iron over wood. They were given orders to depart on December 30th. And for the first day, they left Hampton Roads, ran to Cape Charles, and it was beautiful weather. There's a series of letters from various crewmen and officers that survived that really paint a beautiful picture of, of how good things were from the start and how quickly things went bad as they rounded Cape Hatteras. Accounts from the crewmen on board talked about how the ship would ride up a 20-foot wave and then slide down the other side and plunge into the ocean almost all the way up to the turret and then the ship would pop back up like a cork. Eight o'clock on the evening of uh, December 30th, one of the tow lines snaps and the, and the ship started towing and, and pitching and yawing as the crew referred to it badly. And as the night wore on, the storm increased in just tremendous intensity to where anywhere you had an opening that was in the vessel, she started leaking. Now, in the, in the blackness and the storm, the only thing to focus on to find the ship is the signal lanterns, and one of them is a red signal lantern that was hanging from the turret mast. And one of the monitor's crewmen, after uh, they got off in the second boat, he was on board the Rhode Island, and they talked about watching the red lantern rise a hundred times, watching it fall a hundred times, until finally it didn't come up anymore. In uh, between 1998 and 2002, NOAA conducted some significant recoveries of some of the larger portions of the shipwreck which include the engine, the turret, the propeller, and then about 1,500 associated artifacts that came up with those, those pieces. Today, about 80% of the shipwreck is still in place exactly as it was when she went down in 1862. And it always thrills me, and it happens every time, when these guys who have dove some of the most amazing and challenging dives in the world, they go out on the monitor, and they come back up and they hit the surface and they say, that was the most incredible dive I've ever had in my life. In spite of the deterioration over 140 plus years, the shipwreck still has plenty of surprises and is very impressive.